Hi there, I'm Doug Sillers, and I'm here to present to you how you can use Netflix Conductor to manage your data pipelines. I'm a senior developer relations engineer at Orcus, and if you want to get a hold of me, you can reach out to me on Twitter at Doug Sillers. Okay, so Netflix Conductor is a tool that was built by the folks at Netflix. And of course, we all know who Netflix is. You know, we may have, some of us have probably even watched some videos on Netflix from time to time. Um, and what Conductor is, it's, it's a workflow orchestration engine. It helps you build workflows to process your data, in this case, your data pipelines, or you can use it for lots of other things. And the reason this came about at Netflix is, well, you can imagine there are a lot of workflows that they do that are, just occur over and over and over again. So having a process to automate it makes things easier. Netflix publishes thousands of hours of video every year. And for every hour of video that's published, there's like 500 hours of video that's shot. And all of that needs to be processed, right? So that once a scene is recorded, that it shows up on the director's tablet so they can see if it was a good scene or which camera angle they liked better or how they want to redo it for the next shot. Whenever a video is finished and needs to be uploaded, it needs to be transcoded into lots of different formats. Captions need to be created. So captions in Romanian, in Czech, in Polish, in English, all of those different dubbings and transcriptions and captions all need to be created. And so they have workflows for all of that. The images and the videos that you see when you land at Netflix are all created via conductor workflows as well. So there was a huge need inside Netflix to automate a lot of this. And so they built this tool and they've open sourced it so that anyone can use it. And so it's a microservice orchestration engine. It has all these features that are very, very helpful that can help us build a great data pipeline. It has versioning built in. It has failures built. It can handle failures. It, it doesn't have failures built in. It has the ability to handle failures built in. You can schedule your workflows. You can automate all of your processes. And the great thing about this is Conductor has been used at Netflix for like millions of workflows a month. So it can scale to your need. And so it, it has already been proven to do all of that for you. And then the best part about this is it's all open source. So anyone can use it. If this were a live talk, I would do a live demo of Conductor. Because it isn't live, I'm going to do a walkthrough of a workflow at the end. But what the, the, the workflow we're going to talk about today is a way to measure the stars for an open source repository. So in this case, I would ask you to go to github.com slash Netflix slash Conductor, sign in, and star Netflix Conductor. I think you should do that anyway, but it won't be part of the demo today. Here's an example workflow for Netflix Conductor. And so what you can see here is when you build a workflow, there's a great UI and that UI makes it easier for you to see what's going on, to understand what your workflow is doing, to share it with others, right? A new employee is coming on, you want them to see your workflow, they can see it. There's a picture that sort of describes what's going on that makes it a lot easier to learn. The other great thing about these workflows is that if something goes wrong, you've got this UI that you can dig into and try to debug what's going on uh, while you're building the workflow. Um, all of the workflows inside conductors are uh, DAGs or a directed acyclic graph, which is what we use when we use data pipelines as well. So, you know, conductor is already built in such a way that you can use it to manage your data pipeline. Let's talk about what these different boxes mean. So, these are all workers, and these workers are basically microservices. And so each one of these microservices is wired up using the conductor workflow so that A goes to B, B goes to C, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They can be run in any language, and they pull the conductor server for work. So when a workflow starts, all of these workers are pinging the server, say, hey, do you have something for me? And when there's work, they go do it, feed it back to the workflow, and then the workflow can continue. We also have this idea of system workers. So there's a lot of tasks that you do over and over and over again that you don't really want to roll out a new microservice every single time. So some of these very basic, often repeated uh, workers are actually built into Conductor, so it's a lot easier to build them out and get them started. Some of these workers are HTTP tasks, right? There's no reason to build your own you know, to roll out another worker for all of your HTTP tasks, it's just built into Conductor. You can send out messages to Kafka, you can send off SQS, 
Uh, you can run JavaScript. So if there's some data that you just need to tweak a little bit, or there's also a, a JQ transform, which we'll talk about in a little bit. These all make it easier for you to process the data right there in your conductor workflow. We also have business rules, which we're not going to get to in this talk, but there's documentation up on the website if you're interested. Another really cool thing that's built in to Conductor is the idea of a sub workflow. And with the sub workflow, you can reuse an existing workflow inside your workflow. So this is great. So imagine that a colleague has built this workflow that you need to incorporate into your, into your workflow. You can just cop, put it in there as one box, as one task. And the great thing is, is if your colleague updates their sub workflow, your workflow gets automatically gets those features and those updates as well because it's just built in right it's just calling that sub work that workflow as a sub workflow so all of the the features that you get when somebody updates their workflow comes into yours automatically it also allows us to abstract a few things that we'll talk about as we go through the talk so here you go this is a complicated workflow we've made our workflow a lot simpler because we don't have to show all that we just have one box um, we also have the idea of a fork and so a fork lets us run um, this set of tasks and this set of tasks asynchronously, right? They, they're not, they don't rely on one another. So why have them run serially? We can run them in parallel. And there is idea of a fork join. There's also the idea of a dynamic fork, which we'll not talk about here. Uh, the fork join is defined when you define your workflow. The dynamic fork, the number of times in your fork is defined at runtime. There's a switch task. So this is just like a case, switch case that uh, we all have heard about or used when we're programming. This just lets us pick different pathways depending on the results or how the workflow is going. We also allow you to set variables. We can do a wait, and that wait can wait for an external force to come in and say, okay, we're ready to go. So that could mean that uh, a document is sent off for someone to sign or to review and they hit OK, and that comes back into Conductor and gets it going, right? So this can t these can be really long. A wait task could be like 10 milliseconds, or it could be 10 weeks. There's no limit into how long that wait is. Um, the dynamic fork I just described, and then the loop. And we'll talk about looping in a little bit here as well. Another great thing about Conductor is that we have the ability to version our workflows. So you may start off with a very simple workflow, like I'm going to try it out. I'm just going to have one task in there. And then, of course, as you know, as you build in more features, you end up with more, more tasks. So here's a fork doing two things. Here's now the fork on the right has two tasks instead of one, right? And now it gets even bigger. And the great thing about versioning is you can still call version one while version four is live. So if you were building data pipelines and one of your data pipelines wasn't ready for a new feature, you could run that on version three while the people who are ready for it can run it on version four. And Conductor can handle that, right? You just send, hey, I want to run data pipeline version three and it goes and you're good to go. Um, another great feature that we have inside Conductor is the ability to schedule your workflows. So maybe you want you need to batch this every hour or every five minutes or every second Tuesday after a full moon. You can set that up using our scheduler. It's basically a cron job, but it's built into Conductor. So you don't have to have a cron tab going on and Conductor. You can do it all in one place, see the executions. And then you can also see what workflows were executed based on that scheduler. So you can see if it's actually working. So you can see here, I have a bunch of workflows in my repository that run every night at midnight GMT. Conductor was built by Netflix to handle huge scales and large quantities of data. And the great thing is it's battle tested to do that. And so this is from a conductor discussion from a year or two ago that this person is processing about 300,000 workflows a day, creating one point, running 1 1.5 million tasks a day. And the performance is good and there's room for additional growth. And the thing is, once your conductor server you know, can't grow anymore, you can spin up additional conductor servers and just serialize this out even larger. So it's battle tested and it can run huge, huge quantities of workflows and tasks and data. Conductor is the tool of choice, obviously at Netflix. This is a tool that they've built and are using it throughout their organization. It's also being used at a lot of financial organizations. Uh, we had a talk in our Orcus meetup and there it will be a link later on in the uh, 
in the talk, where GE Healthcare uses Conductor to process all of the images in all of their MRIs and imaging devices that are used in healthcare. GitHub, Tesla, T-Mobile, VMware, the number of companies that are using this are huge, and they're doing it for really, really large and complex workflows. So with that introduction, I'm Doug. Um, I'm a Google developer expert. I've written a book for O'Reilly about building Android apps, which has nothing to do with workflow orchestration. I'm here presenting this today as a senior developer relations engineer at Orcus. If you want to get a hold of me, we've got Slack and Discord all available at orcus.io, or you can hit me up on Twitter. Uh, it's just my user. It's just my name at Doug Sillers. So, what does Orcus have to do with Conductor? Well, Conductor is a free and open source platform, and Orcus is the SaaS managed version of Conductor. So if you're interested in using Conductor, but you don't want to roll your own, uh, you can reach out to us and we can help you get started. We'll also help host it and manage your Conductor uh, platform if you're interested. So let's talk data pipelines. We're gonna talk about ETL pipelines. And an ETL pipeline is extraction, extracting data from some resources, transforming it, and then loading it into another resource. And so we're gonna build an ETL pipeline with Netflix Conductor. And it's a really, really simple, basic ETL pipeline because these can get really complicated, as I'm sure you all know. And so just for the idea of building a simple one that I can present in a short period of time, we're gonna go pretty basic here. Um, the great thing about ETL pipelines is that they're DAGs. They're directed acyclic graphs and Conductor is built as a DAG. So like you can sort of see how I'm gonna to try to fit these all together to make it all work. So can you do data pipelines with Conductor? Well, that's why we're here. Here's the workflow that we're gonna build. And you can see we've got some pre-work stuff that we need to do. We're gonna extract some data here. We're gonna do some transformation. There's some transformation here and then further transformation here. And then we're gonna load it into a second system here. So the workflow I'm gonna build is Netflix Conductor is an open source platform, is an open source tool. It's up on GitHub. It's got a number of stars. We at Orcus want to try to track how many stars and who's starring uh, Netflix Conductor, but the repo is owned by Netflix and we don't have access using the traditional GitHub tools to do that, but GitHub does offer an API where we can pull this out. So we're going to use the GitHub API to extract the most recent stargazers. They call them stargazers. Um, the people who have starred a GitHub repo are called stargazers. We're going to extract that data we get a big JSON document, right? It's, it's just an HTTP request and we get a big HTTP body back. Um, then we're gonna transform it. We're gonna simplify this because we only really need the day it was starred and the username. So <laughs> all this other data that we just wanted that, we don't care. So we're gonna get rid of that, simplify it, reparameterize it into the format that we need for the next system. And then we're gonna upload it. And the tool we're gonna use to upload is a tool called Orbit. And Orbit is a community tracking tool so what it does is it's following, you know, if you subscribe to uh, the Orcus GitHub channel, like we track that. And if you subscribe, if you, f uh, if you follow us on LinkedIn, we're gonna follow that, right? If you go to one of our meetups, we follow that. And this is just another one of those things. We wanna see how our community is engaging with Netflix Conductor. And so we can get this data from GitHub and using a conductor workflow to extract, transform, and load the data, we can get it into orbit. All right, so the other thing we wanna do is we wanna run this every 24 hours. Um, you know, we could run this every hour. There's not that many people starring conductor. So like every 24 hours is a nice, is one of those nice balances of like, it needs to be up to date, but it doesn't need to be like up to date to the minute. Um, so 24 hours, we decided it was a good enough time frame to do this. Obviously with different pipelines, you're gonna change that timing, whether it needs to run every second, whether it needs to run every day, maybe every week. And then because it gets uploaded into orbit, we can start tracking how many stars are happening every single day. So let's walk through how I built this workflow. The first thing we need to do is we need to send some input data. And so what we need to do is we need to tell our workflow that we want to look at the Netflix conductor repo. I'm gonna send in my API token 
because uh, GitHub does rate limit you if you don't have an API token. And I'm going to be making a bunch of calls in like just a couple seconds. The other thing is when GitHub sends off the people who have starred the repo, they give you, they start at zero, the first person who ever starred the repo. And I already have that data. So I only, I only, I'm going to start at 3,800 because if I start at 3,800, um, I'm only going to make six or seven calls rather than because the first 38 calls, I'm not going to use any of that data anyway. And so this is just something that every couple of weeks I go in and change this because, you know, now we're at 4,700 stars. And so I can change that number to 4,500 or whatever it is, just so that I'm not making as many API calls. I'm going to upload this in my Orbit workspace with my Orbit API key, and I'm going to call the activity starred conductor because obviously it's people who start conductor, right? You want to naming things. Okay, so I send in all of this data, and then my first task is to calculate the start cutoff. And so I'm going to run this every 24 hours. So if I'm running this today, August 1st, or I guess tomorrow, August 2nd at midnight GMT, I want to get all of the stars from uh, August second, from August first at midnight to August second at midnight, and so this is just saying, hey, I want to get uh, the last twenty four hours, and so the date I'm going to use is uh, I'm using an inline task, and the inline task is just running JavaScript, and so I, what I do is I take the date now and I subtract eighty six thousand four hundred seconds, um, and that gives me the date from yesterday at midnight. And so that's going to tell me I want the last 24 hours. All right, so now I have the date that I'm going to start at. Uh, and so I want everything from that date to now. The next thing I need to do is get the re repository details, right? And so this is an HTTP task. I'm going to ping the a GitHub API and say, hey, how many stargazers are there, are there today? So I know I start at 3,800 and I go up to uh, get repo details, output body stargazers, right? I want to know how many stargazers there are now so I can build, you know, my request to go up to that number. And so I just make an HTTP call. Again, this is a built-in uh, system task to conductor, right? I haven't written any workers yet. This is all just built into conductor. And so I call like Netflix conductor, how many people are there? All right, so now I need to extract the data. And you can see here, this is a loop. It's a do while loop, and so I'm going to do this a number of times. Now, a directed acyclic graph means that it can only go in one direction. And, you know, the second term is acyclic. There can't be any cycles inside it. So how can I build a loop in something that's acyclic? Well, it turns out it's not actually a loop. It's not really a loop. So what I'm doing here is, all right, so if my offset is, so let's start at 3,800, I can only get 100 at a time, right? The API from GitHub says you can get 100 users at a time using this API. So I can get 3,800 to 3,899. And so the way I do that is I have to calculate which page I'm on. So page, page 1 is 0 to 99. Page 2 is 100 to 199. So I, to get this 3,800 to 3,899, I need page 39. So I can calculate that. That's another inline task, right? It's just dot JavaScript. I'm starting at 3,800. My counter is this. Let's just do a little math and figure out the page. All right. Then this says, all right, I want to get from 3,800 to 3,899. Um, so here's the, the JavaScript, right? So my offset divided by 100 plus the counter of the loop, and I can get an in integer. And then this says, hey, GitHub, give me 100 per page, page 39. And I get all that results. And then I do a little bit of cleanup here just to make it. We'll talk about that in a second. So this isn't really a loop. This is just a mechanism to show that I'm going to do this a bunch of times. And so really, I'm getting page 39, page 40, page 41, page 42, page 43, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until I hit that top number of stargazers number. In this example, the number of stars when I created this deck was 4342. So it stops here. It doesn't get any higher than that because that's all I've got. So while it is a loop, it's just a construct to allow us to iter to do multiple iterations of these tasks because the graph is still a DAG, right? It's just doing 38, 30, 4, 39, 40, 41, 42 serially. Um, so the graph is still a DAG. All right, the last step here is I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. 
and I'm going to use a JQ transform. JQ is a command line tool that helps, that is used to clean up JSON. And so let's walk through what's going on here. So the first thing I'm going to do is going to get the star list, which is the 100, pe the 100 stars from my GitHub call. I'm going to select the people who start it, where the start at is greater than the the cutoff time, right? So the cutoff says August 1st at midnight. So I'm only going to select the ones that are higher than that because I don't want any of the other ones. We'll just throw those away. So that's going to, and then I want to convert that into the format that I want. So I'm just simplifying this so I don't have to transmit all of that data over and over and over again. So I get something that looks like this, right? So at on May 19th, 2022, this person starred conductor. Now, once that loop runs a whole bunch of times, I could have a whole lot of data in lots of different loop structures. So all these different JSON structures, and I need to combine all of that into one. I do a JQ transform. So I take um, my big list from the do while loop, and I just say, you know, let's just put them all into one JSON array so I can manipulate the data a little bit more easily. Now, I'm using JQ transforms here. And this is probably not the way that most people deal with huge data sets, right? Because it might be too big. It might be too much for JQ to do. Um, so if the JQ transform is too basic, we have SDKs. Each one of these tasks don't have to be system tasks like the JQ transform. You could write your own Python microservice or C Sharp or Clojure or Java or Go and coming soon, JavaScript TypeScript, right? We have SDKs that let you write microservices to do whatever you need to do with the data. If it's the extraction, if it's the transformation, if it's the loading, you can do anything you want with these different, um, with writing a microservice as opposed to using a task built into Conductor. And if you're interested, we do have SDKs. You can check them out here. Uh, again, all open source, all available for anyone to use. And you can also see that we haven't updated the logo for Conductor on that uh, repo. So that's on my list of things to do after I give this talk. All right, so now we've extracted the data, we've transformed the data, and now we can load it. And so again, I've got another loop here, and this is just one of these things because of the way the upload to orbit works, I had to do it as a loop. And we'll talk about why I had to do that. The first thing I have to do here is I have to do a zero offset fix. And this is another inline task where I just have to manipulate the JSON a little bit to make it work to upload into orbit. And one of the reasons for that is we've got an off by one error. And you know, the hardest thing in programming, right, is off by one errors in naming things. Um, the problem is our JSON result list is, is, a, is JSON, so it's iterated 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But the do while loop starts its counter at 1. So we needed to subtract by 1 to get to that first entry in our JSON list. And then we can extract that entry and post it to orbit. Orbit only lets us upload one activity at a time. We can't like bulk upload. Like if I had 100 things, I can't just say, here, Orbit, here are 100 things. They say, no, we want 100 requests of one thing at a time. That's the way they built it, so that's what we've got to do, which is why we have this loop here. Otherwise, I could just send that JSON up and we'd be done. That would be my load. But because of the way that this system works, I had to do something a little bit more custom. All right, and so then I can upload to orbit, and this is just an HTTP task. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about what I had to do to make this HTTP task work as well. Um, I just send one result at a time. The Orbit API only allows for 120 calls a minute. So if we ever had a day where there were a lot of people who starred, uh, who starred Conductor, and I have other workflows that are uploading into Orbit at the same time, and so if they all run at midnight, I might exceed my upload API of 120 calls a minute. So what I've done is my upload task for Orbit, which I can reuse across all my different workflows where I am doing ETLs for different data sets and putting them into Orbit, I can reuse this task over and over and over again. And Conductor knows that this API has a limit of 120 calls per minute. So what I've actually done is I've, set the, I've told Conductor only to send 100 every minute. So I'd never exceed, there's never a 429, you've exceeded your 
your API rate limit. So because Conductor knows it can only send 160 seconds, I can call this task across a million different workflows and my colleagues can use it and anyone else can use it and Conductor will prevent uh, us, will prevent all of those people from exceeding this orbit API limitation, this rate limitation. Uh, it will just slow down all of the workflows just a little bit to make sure that it's only sending a hundred updates to orbit every single minute. So that's a really cool feature because you don't have to worry about your APIs blowing through rate limits and you, your colleagues don't either. Like Conductor just handles that for you. Another thing we have to consider when we're running workflows is that sometimes things won't work. So here's an example of a failure where a task actually failed. And I'm kind of giving you a sneak preview of the new UI, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But you can see here green means this one worked. Uh, red means this one failed. And in this case, I didn't add the um, the API key. So it just said 401, like we don't know who you are, so you're forbidden. Um, but when you have a task, you can set the timeouts, the number of retries and the delay. So if one of your tasks doesn't work, Conductor doesn't immediately fail the whole thing, unless it's catastrophic, like you forget to add your API key. But if it's just like, oh, there's a timeout or something didn't work right, um, it'll try again. And it'll keep trying as number as many times as you told. So your workflow is more likely to succeed and not um, fail just to do some, due to some arbitrary issue that happened on some third party integration. You can also set, sometimes your workflow does fail. And if your workflow does fail, like a task says, this is catastrophic, I can't continue, the whole workflow will fail, you can set a failure workflow. And this is just a parameter in your workflow that says, hey, call this other conductor workflow when my workflow fails. And this shipping failure is a very simple workflow because again, it's a demo app. It sends me a Slack message, right? So this sends me a, a message on Slack. And here's some example Slack messages that I pulled out from the last week, right? This one says, ah, um, you did something wrong, um, 403 forbidden, right? You didn't send the right key or for whatever reason you made the wrong API call, you can't access it, so it failed. So this helps me debug. Why did it fail? Ah, in this sub workflow, um, I got a 403. So now I can go in and debug a little bit. I know exactly where to start looking. Um, this one, I uh, for, didn't send the JSON map. I sent, so I sent the wrong file over. And so now I know where to go in and debug. And I know which workflow ID, this is my workflow ID that I need to go investigate. If you ever wanted to fail a workflow because something happened, like imagine somebody's applying for a bank account and you say no, right? You can add a custom error, right? So you can actually end a workflow, you know, based on the logic that happens, right? This person applied for a loan and we didn't approve them. So you can actually send a custom error not approved, right? So you can actually send a failure off that says, we don't need to investigate this one. This workflow failed because we didn't approve the customer. So that's another thing you can do with the failure workflow. And the great thing about all of this is that we've got this API rate limiting, we've got the failures, all of this is built in. So as you're building your data pipelines, you can actually account for all of this and just account for it all in the conductor. You don't have to do anything separate, it's just all built in. So we've got this data pipeline with conductor that I've just walked through. You can extract the data, you can transform the data and then load it, right? We've built a simple, really, really basic ETL of data pipeline. Of course, when you build an ETL pipeline, it's gonna be more complicated. Maybe you have three or four different data sources you need to extract from, right? Build a fork, extract it from three different places and then transform it and load it, right? Everybody's workflow is gonna look a little bit different, but the flexibility of Conductor allows you to quickly and easily manipulate your workflows and add tasks and remove tasks and copy somebody else's and paste it in or use their sub workflow. It's so extensible that it's really easy to create your own custom ETL pipeline. Now that you've got that ETL pipeline, what if you wanted to do that same thing for a bunch of different inputs? So in this case, I can run it as a sub workflow to get the stars for Conductor for Uber Cadence and for Temporal. These are our competitors. So we can track how we're doing compared to the other folks. And because I've abstracted it out that I input the GitHub repo and the GitHub owner, 
I can do this, right? I can build a sub workflow. This again runs every day at midnight and I can run it and then I can have a comparison table. So I'm not gonna do the live demo. The live demo was going to be, let's see how many people starred GitHub Conductor during this talk, but let's actually just go and look at the workflow that ran a couple days ago. So I'll come out of presentation mode here and we'll come over here. This is a view from uh, the playground of Orcus. And this is my GitHub star workflow. And so you can see here, it, this is the new UI. So I was gonna talk about the new UI, but here's a sneak preview, right? Here it is. Um, we can look at all the different steps. So the first thing we do is we calculate the start cutoff. And so what we can see here is the output is uh, July 29th at midnight. Um, then we say, how many stargazers were there? And we can look, this is calling, let's see, we can see the input. The input is calling um, GitHub. And the output, if we look in the body here, tells me that there are currently 4,681 stargazers. So that's the, the upward limit. Then we have a do while loop where we go through and we go from 3,800 to 4,681 and it's gonna loop through. And so we can actually see this has to go nine times. We can see that we have iterations, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to nine. So 38 to 3,800 to 3,899, and then this is the 4,600 range, right? And so we can see the output for each one of these, right? We get, you know, a hundred people, right? Who have starred conductor, and we can see the dates and times. So we could look at number 13. This was done on May 3rd, and we can get all the information about that user. And then what this one does is it only finds the ones that were done in the last 24 hours. And so all of these will be empty because these will have no results, right? Um, but the last one, let's see how many we had. We had six, we got six stars on that day. Okay, and so these, this is now optimized and transformed uh, to give us the six that we want. This is another further transforming, cleaning up that data. And now we can upload it all into orbit. And so what we can see here is again, now there's six iterations, right? The user zero, one, two, three, four, and five, right? So all of these are now uploaded to orbit and we can see is the output um, 201 success, right? So these all got uploaded. And so the entire workflow runs through, extracts everything from GitHub, transforms it, and we're using JQ transforms here because it's fairly simple data. And then we upload it in, uh, into our new system. And so I gave you a live demo of how this all works inside the Orcus playground. Using open source conductor looks very, very similar. The UI is a little bit different, um, but it would work exactly the same way. So data pipelines with conductor. Um, if you're interested in learning about how people do these sorts of things, um, you know, orchestration pipelines are kind of exactly the same as data pipelines. Instead of handling video data or image data from GE, you're just handling, you know, database information and you're just sending it through. It's the same thing. And so conductors features are really well suited for data pipelines. If you're interested in learning about how people are doing this in the real world, we have a channel on our, on the Orcus IO YouTube channel, and it's all demonstrations of people doing this in industry. So we have people from Netflix and from GE and from lots of other organizations on how they're using Netflix Conductor in production. So coming soon features, I sort of showed you this in my live demo, but we've got a new UI coming, right? So it's, you know, this is great and it's a really great way to debug what's going on, but the new UI just gives you more interactivity, more details, and it frankly, it looks prettier. Um, so it's, it's a great way to do more things uh, with Conductor. One of our goals is to take it from a developer tool, which is great, but also have be allow people to do complete, do complete workflow creation using the UI. So you, you can almost make it a low code or no code platform for creating workflows. Another thing that's coming really, really soon is you saw that in my workflow, I was sending in my API keys, which isn't super ideal. 
um, we're adding secrets. And so secrets allows you to define the secrets and then call them, just like an environmental variable in most of our programming languages, letting us do this more securely. So there's a lot of great features coming down the pipeline. We're doing a lot of really cool stuff, and we're really excited to share that with the data structures community. So uh, give it a shot, see what's going on. In conclusion, Netflix Conductor is a super powerful tool to help you run your data pipelines. If you want to try it out, you can try it for free in the Orcus Playground. All you need is an email address. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. We've got a Discord channel and a Slack channel where people are there to help you all the time. I'm there too. Or you can reach out to me on Twitter. With that, thank you very much for listening to what I had to say. And I'll be, I will be online to answer any questions that you might have.